And I will now turn it over to my colleague, Leah uh, Watkiss, to open us with prayer. And I'm just going to pop that onto the screen now. Thanks, Catherine. My name is Leah Watkiss. I work for the Sisters of St. Joseph of Toronto in their Ministry for Social Justice, Peace, and Creation Care. Um, that is my role here today. And I would like to welcome everyone and encourage everyone to just take a moment, close your eyes, take in a deep breath, and exhale. Take a moment. And then join me in prayer. We hold our human siblings who suffer from storms and droughts intensified by climate change. We hold all species that suffer. We hold world leaders delegated to make decisions for life. We pray that the web of life may be mended through courageous actions to limit carbon emissions. We pray for right actions for adaptation and mitigation to help our already suffering Earth community. We pray that love and wisdom might inspire my actions and our actions as communities so that we may with integrity look into the eyes of our human siblings and all beings and truthfully say, we are doing our part to care for them and the future of the children. May love transform us and our world with new steps toward life. Let's take another breath together. that prayer came from the um, Interfaith Power and Light Group. Welcome to this evening. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we are going to be, uh, this is going to be a panel discussion that we are, that we are watching. Uh, and so there won't be a time for Q&A and the only people who will be, who will have their mics on uh, in the course of this will be uh, Leigh and myself and our panelists this evening. Um, you can use the Zoom, you can use the chat feature to uh, send uh, technical questions to Leigh and myself if you're having trouble with your connection. Um, I also wanted to comment on the fact that tonight's content uh, can be difficult. Uh, it lifts up issues of racism and experiences of environmental degradation, uh, which can be difficult and possibly triggering for some people. And so we've included at this time. Um, phone numbers for uh, for support for anybody who's in crisis, and please just um, know that uh, if you need to step away, this is being the content is being recorded. If you need to step away for self care, please don't hesitate to do that. Take those steps that you find necessary to care for yourself, knowing um, that you'll have an opportunity to come back and revisit the content later if you're if you're comfortable doing so. Uh, and finally, uh, Leah and myself will spend two minutes uh, having just offering uh, what is a very initial definition of what environmental racism is and how it manifests in Canada, knowing that this is not the end of that conversation, but only the very, very, very beginning. And this definition will expand and be nuanced as, uh, as our speakers uh, address how this manifests and what we can do about it in, uh, in, our con in Canada. Environmental racism looks like the disproportionate and greater exposure of Indigenous and racialized communities to contamination and toxins in the environment. It looks like policies that allow harmful contaminations and differential rates of cleanup for Indigenous and racialized community. And it looks like a history of excluding Indigenous and racialized community from mainstream environmental decision-making arenas. And if you were to go to the Canadian Encyclopedia, the definition that is offered there is that environmental racism is the disproportionate proximity and greater exposure of Indigenous, Black, and other racialized community 
to polluting industries and environmentally hazardous activities. There's a much longer and much more in-depth article uh, at the Canadian Encyclopedia, but this is uh, just one uh, snapshot uh, to summarize what we're talking about uh, this evening. Uh, one piece of policy that you will uh, that you will hear raised with all of our panelists this evening is Bill C226, uh, which is uh, legislation that is before Parliament right now. It has gone through the House of Commons and is currently sitting uh, with the Senate for consideration. So it's not law, but it is it is a, it is a proposed policy, and it is called Nas the National Strat Strategy Respecting Environmental Racism and Environmental Justice Act. It's a private member's bill and it would require the federal government to study the link between race and socioeconomic status and environmental risk and to develop ways to address environmental racism. And so now I'll turn it over to my colleague, Leah. Thank you, Catherine. Um, so I have the great privilege and honor of introducing our first speaker this evening. Uh, Dr. Lior Gansworth is an Indigenous scholar of Anishinaabe ancestry. She received her PhD in geography from York University and is now a postdoctoral researcher at the Osgood Hall Law School, and we are thrilled to have her here. Dr. Lior, I hand it over to you. Apologies, go ahead. No problem, that was a surprise. <laughs> uh, miigwech Leah, and thanks everybody for um, for this time that we shared together. Um, I'm just gonna jump right in and with my comments. Um, and so I, I believe we were asked to start with perhaps an expansion or a response to this question of what is environmental racism as we understand it um, for panelists. So the way I would define um, environmental racism and I'll get to my encounters with it, um, but the first, I'd like to just kind of put it into a little bit of a framing from my view as Anishinaabe Kwe. So I grew up um, on a reserve territory in New York State, um, and I have connections to other reserve territories um, in Canada and elsewhere, um, uh, so-called Canada, right, and so-called states. And so um, I'm intimately familiar with the uh, policy history that has led to the creation of reserves and to um, sacrifice zones more broadly. Um, so I would say that environmental racism, as I define it, is disproportionate and undue influence over land occupation, decision making, and environmental governance based on false ideas of superiority and domination. So for us, um, historically, my family, I'm talking about my bloodlines, my communities, my relatives, my ancestors, that has looked like disruption, destruction, and denial of Indigenous legal orders, our ways of being, societies, peoples, and places. It has meant the criminalization of our spiritual practices. It has meant uh, the breaking up of our families and the removal of our medicine people um, and the pathologizing of ceremonies, demonizing children, elders, and medicine people. Um, and some people might not be able to make the clear connection as to how this is related to environmental racism in its current iterations. But what I'm saying is that these are all foundational pieces of the structure that we live in and the structure that we live in being uh, settler colonialism which also is related to the racialization of peoples. So um, the late anthropologist and professor emeritus Audrey Smedley wrote about the rise of scientific racism. And I'll offer a quote um, from Dr. Smedley, who said, from the beginnings of European expansion and colonization, questions had been raised about the identity of indigenous peoples discovered around the new world. Those are my air quotes. Were they truly human? Did they have souls? Were they rational beings? Until well into the 19th century, the major sources of knowledge and explanations of the world and its complexities were the biblical interpretations and inferences made largely by men of the church. So I would also point folks, if they're interested in learning more about Dr. Smedley's work and about this idea of scientific racism, um, to look up a three-part documentary called Race, the Power of an Illusion. Uh, because what I'm referring to when I say indigenous peoples is um, the, the idea of peoples as part of an international legal order. So peoples in international law refer to specific political entities that determine their own citizenship and the racialization of people in Canada and the US is a part of that colonial structure. Whereas um, indigenous 
uh, belonging and identity is determined in other ways for communities. Uh, race is certainly a factor in, in a lot of our modern iterations, but I want to be really clear about how, how I'm using that term and how I'm responding to that proposition of racism. So when we think about what an Indigenous framework looks like and what a conceptual framework of relation with environment and, and relationship with place, um, it's very much about interactions and relationships, right? Um, so to quote Dr. Deborah McGregor, these relationships are not only what we see around us, but all that has come before us. So again, our ancestors, including um, ancestors in the landscape, the water as an ancestor, trees as ancestors, a fish and others um, who have been on earth much longer than human beings have in our understanding. Um, and all those that come after as well. So future generations. So we have to understand ourselves in those nodes of existence that we are one generation among many. And so when we look at um, the disproportionate impact to contaminants, for example, we see that there is a political and um, legal history that enables this idea of put toxic contaminants near the Indians, right? And the Indian being a legal term, a federal term. Um, and that is where we see some of the injustice that shows up as lack of access to clean drinking water, lack of access to medicines, lack of access to other healing modalities that are all about um, seizing and hoarding uh, the power that was implicit in indigenous societies when their ceremonies and their ways of life were strong and healthy. So one story I have, and this is unfortunately a, a very common occurrence. I work in a lot of environments where I'm um, uh, in conversation with people who know very little about indigenous history, society, et cetera. And there was a conflict in a local community that was about um, whether or not a development should be allowed to continue given the fact that the site was private property and had been identified as an indigenous grave site. And I was chatting with one of my colleagues about that. Um, and it was very upsetting and distressing to me because I know intimately the history of what happens when grave sites are disturbed and destroyed. Um, but I understand too that people often don't make that connection and they don't see that as being related to an, um, an indigenous experience of environmental racism, but that was how I was interpreting it. So my colleague said to me, well, you know, if it was just a regular gravesite, I think it would be no problem to protect it, but why couldn't, why couldn't they set it up in a regular way? So they didn't understand that the gravesite was like, I think 400 years old and that it had um, implications, right? For the communities and the people that descend from those people who were resting in that site. So that is one instance of many where um, the, the relevance of grave sites have gone unrecognized and then I would also say too that in more uh, in a more broad sense, I've done a lot of work around uh, fishing and witnessing people um, fishing in different areas, and I've seen so much um, exposure to contaminants uh, for Indigenous and other um, people of color uh, while fishing, and them being resigned to accepting that because that that is the space that they're uh, that they have access to. So I'll stop there. Um, I don't want to take up too much time, but those are some of my preliminary thoughts. And miigwech, Pizindao, I thank you for listening to me. Thank you for that, um, for that very powerful opening, uh, Lior. I really appreciate your words. I'm just going to change the spotlights. Uh, our second panelist this evening is Naolo Charles, and Naolo is the founder of the Black uh, Environmental Initiative and co-founder of the Canadian Coalition for Environmental Climate Justice, a coalition launched to support racialized communities, uh, racialized communities affected by pollution and climate change impacts, and which was instrumental in bringing forward and supporting the development of Bill C226. Um, Naolo holds a master's degree in the environment and is an environmental communications specialist. He's spoken at conferences and in the media about environmental justice and was also one of the experts invited on an advisory table brought together by the federal government to develop Canada's first national adaptation strategy for climate change. 
He's involved in social entrepreneurship and has a decade of ex over a decade of experience with foundations, universities, governments, and startups. Thank you so much for joining us this evening, Neola. Trying to remove it. Thank you so much, Catherine. And hi, everyone. It's really uh, an honor to be here. Um, so I'd like to start by introducing myself as an immigrant. So I'm actually an immigrant. I came to Canada 20 years ago. And I want to start my story this way, um, because one of the questions that um, was asked to us was, what was your first encounter uh, with uh, environmental racism? Or do you have any example of your experience with environmental racism. I started uh, being interested in the environmental sector in 2006. Um, in 2006, there was a boat called Provo Koala that was actually full of toxic waste, looking for a place to dump it in the world. And this boat traveled across the oceans going four or five different countries. And then it arrived in my country, my home country, which is called uh, Cote d'Ivoire, in my hometown where I grew up, which is Abidjan. And they dumped tons of toxic waste in open air um, on the land. Uh, a lot of people died from the impact of that. A lot of people got sick from, from, from this episode. The company ended about 10 years later, uh, paying back some uh, damages to the people who've been impacted. But the way that impacted me is that it made me reflect and wonder, how is that possible that waste that is created at the other side of the world comes in my hometown? And at the time I used to, I used to live in, in, in Montreal. So, but I heard of the story and that, that story really impacted me. So I was wondering how did how did waste created somewhere else in the world actually arrive in um, my country? So that led me to want to study the question, and and that's how I ended up going to do my master's uh, in environment. And I specialized in trying to track. I specialized in something called life cycle assessment, which allows us to actually track the story of products. So that, that was my specialty. So I ended up looking at one product and being, being able to identify what is the story, the environmental story of a product. And at the time when I heard about the Provo Koala story, I already knew that uh, one of the big issues we have in West Africa, especially in Congo, uh, is this, this uh, I don't know if, you, if you've ever heard of that, the Caltech, Caltain. Um, issue, which is a very precious mineral that is uh, needed in, in computers and a lot of electronic devices. And it's all coming from Congo. And for the last 25 years, the war in Congo uh, has been continuing just because we need that mineral. So when I realized that story of Propopoala and I connected it to the story of uh, Cotton in, in Congo, then I, start, I started wondering, how is that possible that companies come in and get minerals from our countries, they produce products that are consumed somewhere else, and then they bring, bring back the trash to us, right? And uh, in my opinion, this was the first form of environmental racism that I've been exposed to. And at the time, I didn't know how to call it. I didn't know that it was called environmental racism but I knew something wasn't right. And in fact, um, the data shows that Africa has the lowest regional rate of e-waste production in the world, but it, it's actually one of the main places where all of the waste of the world uh, arrives, just like in Asia as well. So you have a lot of poor people working in, in the dumps and that definitely has a, a, a lot of impact on people's health. But it also comes with a lot of greenwashing. So you will see the industry talking about this as recycling. 
So we're actually sending products uh, back to Africa so that people can recycle it. So I became really uh, attuned to the connection between uh, greenwashing and uh, you know, harmful industry practices. Uh, what I realized after that was that even in Canada and even in rich countries, people who look like me or indigenous people are treated as if they live in a third world country in Canada. And so that led me to really try and reflect and, and, and better understand how, how all of that is possible. So for me, environmental racism is it's not really a some kind of a new phenomenon. It's not really something that uh, we need to better understand a new trend that we need to, 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 to a new problem that we need to better understand. That's not what uh, environmental racism is. Environmental racism is just an output of racism in society. And it's really about power. When we talk about environmental racism, we talk about the fact that some communities are powerless compared to others when it comes to protecting their land from uh, attacks from polluting industries. So if you see there's so many examples of communities that are able to protect their, their, uh, their lands and other communities were not able to do, to do so. And the, re the reason why this is, is because of the devaluation of people of color that comes from the history that we, we, we share. Um, but that devaluation also translates into the devaluation of the land where these people live. So I actually became really, uh, I, I won't say a specialist, but I became really passionate about learning all the dimensions of that issue. So when we talk about environmental racism, it's a multi-dimensional issue. We talk about, for instance, the, the systematic exposure of some communities to pollution. That's one, one of the dimensions. We talk about the neglect of infrastructures in some communities, you know, governments, uh, institutions not taking care of the, 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 in, the infrastructure in the communities where there's a lot of racialized people. We talk about the lack of services, lack of access to healthy nutrition. All of these issues are connected to environmental racism. We also talk about the lack of access to green space. There's a lot of data that shows that some communities actually have less access to green space, and it's not just an accident. Um, so, There's actually, there's been a moment when uh, the UN rapporteur, I, I don't know how you say it in English, but so UN, uh, someone, someone who came from the UN in Canada, and he actually said that there's actually 1 million low income people in Canada who are living around one kilometer of a polluting facility. So that's the data. And it's, I think it's quite scary to, to see that a country like Canada also has this reality. But the reason why it's a reality is because environmental racism is really a continuation of colonization, as uh, my colleague before suggested. And I think if we really want to better understand the problem, we have to center it in colonization. Catherine suggested that we don't have enough time to go into it. So, you know, we, we, we can talk about it, but we're, we may not be able to talk about it enough. One conference is not enough to talk about this issue. Um, but I think there's so many examples. I can give you a lot of examples, but one of the messages I want you to leave with is that we don't need, it's not about examples. It's about understanding what environmental racism really is. It's about understanding its connection to the history that we have. If you actually, if you actually understand the history of colonization, environmental racism is, ju is just a, a, a conclusion of it. It's not something that you're going to try to understand. You will just understand that it, 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 it's just part of the DNA of our society that we treat some communities differently. And, and, and so I, I really invite 
not everyone cares about this issue or who's trying to better understand this issue to actually look at the, at the issue more in a bro broader term, not just specific in environmental racism, but look at society as a whole, look at the history and look at how we've been treating people. And it's just a consequence of it. The, the fact that some uh, institutions, some governments will not take care of some communities the same way that they would when it comes to white communities is a reflection of the way we think. It's a reflection of the devaluation of people in our minds. It's not just uh, some, some kind of, it's not just a, a new trend uh, that, 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 that came now. The term environmental racism itself was first used in, in, this, in, this, in the 70s. So it's a, it's a long time ago. It's not something that we, we, uh, we discovered now. And we talk. We can talk about that history as well. But I'm going to stop here. I want to allow Jane to uh, contribute as well, and uh, hopefully we can talk more about uh, more details in the next sessions. Thank you, uh, Nilo, for your for your opening uh, remarks and for so clearly tying um, what we're discussing tonight to to a history of of broad racism. Um, our third panelist this evening is uh, Dr. Jane MacArthur. Uh, Jane is the Toxics Program Director for the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment, which brings together healthcare workers and physicians who are seeking, uh, who are seeing the impacts of environmental degradation in their patients and in their practices. Jane holds a PhD in sociology and social justice and is an experienced occupational and environmental health justice researcher, communicator, and advocate. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine, and thank you, Leah, for inviting me to be with you this evening. Thanks to everyone who's joined with us for this conversation tonight, and thank you, Leora and Neolo, for everything you've already said and your contributions and um, for allowing me to, to share a few words and thoughts um, as part of this important talk. So as Catherine said, I'm the Toxics Program Director with the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment. I'm a settler here from my home on the traditional territories of the Three Fires Confederacy of First Nations, comprised of the Ojibwa, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi. Indigenous culture in the area is an important basis of many traditions, customs, languages, and connections to the land here and its life-sustaining resources. And archeological evidence indicates that First Nations had summertime settlements around this region and the Point Pelee Marsh as early as 600 current era. The Ojibwe had a settlement along the Detroit River and early colonizers reported the presence of Huron cornfields on the river as well. This region was also a terminal on the Underground Railroad Network. Today, it's called by some Windsor, Essex, Ontario, and in part because of its historical roots, it's still home to many Indigenous and racialized people. Windsor is connected with Detroit, Michigan in the United States by a bridge and a tunnel both a little over a kilometre and a half long, and so because of their close proximity, there is a lot that is shared between the two regions, water, air, industries, and cultures. In more recent history, this region is known as the auto capital of Canada, a distinction, a distinction we share with our border city of Detroit. And so this manufacturing history, including the auto industry, uh, means Detroit was also a blue collar town and union struggle and civil rights struggle are part of the history due in part to the exposures and poor working conditions uh, for people working in the asbestos and the auto industry and metalworking fluids uh, and more recently exposure to endocrine disrupting chemicals from the plastics plants and pesticides and the farm work in this region and traffic related air pollution at the Ambassador Bridge. Windsor's history is significant in understanding the moment we're in now and the environmental racism bill before us. The reality of toxic exposures and the people who are disproportionately exposed is known and lived by the Black, Indigenous, and racialized community members where I live and who are in closest proximity to the most harmful exposures. But often the data to illustrate it is incomplete, in part because Canada does not track racialization in health as some other countries do. Now, Windsor, as the 
previous uh, panelists have said, you know, there are many examples of the problem of environmental racism in Canada. Windsor is just one. And as a white settler, I bring my privilege to the table. And these are not my experiences. But the reason I know these truths is that the racialized and indigenous and black people who have shared their experiences of colonization, oppression, uh, environmental racism and ill health through their stories, the reports, the research and the data that do exist, they outline that this phenomenon of environmental racism is real and pervasive. We know that the groups most impacted by climate change and environmental hazards are indigenous, racialized and otherwise vulnerabilized people. This is true in Canada today and was observed by the UN Special Rapporteur on Toxics who Naolo already mentioned in their 2020 report to the Human Rights Council where they said, there exists a pattern in Canada where marginalized groups and indigenous peoples in particular find themselves on the wrong side of a toxic divide subject to conditions that would not be acceptable anywhere else in Canada. These toxic burdens faced by the racialized communities are linked to high rates of cancer, reproductive diseases, respiratory illnesses, and other health problems. And I believe that I, and that we all have an obligation to work against this reality and create a new future that's healthy, equitable, and just. And this conversation is part of that. So I thank you for being here tonight and for having me to be a part of it. Thank you so much, Jane, for your contribution to this rich discussion that we're having here today. So um, at this point, we are going to move into our panel discussion. Uh, so we've got all three of our speakers up on your screen now. And uh, we're going to start with the kind of as our first question. Why are you engaged in this work? And if if you're here on behalf of an organization as well, why is your organization involved in this work? Um, Lior, did you wanna go first, Dan? Um, sure, thank you so much. And I just wanna say thank you to uh, Neolo and Jane for um, your sharing and for your wisdom. And um, really grateful again to be here with you all. So the question um, of why, I suppose, um, I'm here um, representing my own perspective, but also I'm affiliated with the Center for Indigenous Languages and Knowledges at York University and the Indigenous Environmental Justice Project, which I've worked with for several years now through Dr. Deborah McGregor. Um, and I don't speak for anybody there, but I can say my involvement and some of the involvement that I've heard of others is very much about our responsibilities as Anishinaabe Kwe which is Anishinaabe women, our responsibilities have a lot to do with water and have a lot to do with um, an ancestral intergenerational sort of inheritance that comes from um, being connected to all the generations of life that lived, struggled, survived, thrived on uh, Chimiknek Menasing, which is the Great Turtle Island um, for, for so long, for so many generations. And I always think it's completely remarkable to say that after all of the um, state-sponsored and church-sponsored efforts to remove us, we're still here. And so I find that persistence remarkable and a type of miracle in a way, but I also know that we have agency and that's given to us from Gijim Benido, which is our creator. And so I feel very honored to carry those responsibilities forward. And so when I think about what it means to try to pursue justice, I recognize that um, as um, was so brilliant, brilliantly stated um, by Naolo, it's we're talking about an intergenerational, or excuse me, an interdimensional conception of justice, right? So it's about um, uh, remediation, but it's also about repair. Um, and some things, you know, cannot be repaired. Some of the destruction that has happened to um, sacred sites, homelands, and other other places and spaces um, is sort of um, is, is such a great destruction that it, it's not replaceable. Yet at the same time, um, I feel very, very called to respond to the interactions I've had through 
um, participation in ceremonial life, through participation on the land, listening to water, listening to trees, being with land, um, and recognizing that that land has agency, spirit, and memory as well. So again, to bring the work of Dr. McGregor into the conversation, she's written extensively about how um, where we must address the historical trauma of water as well as our own historical trauma. So she proposes a sort of three-pronged approach of power, love, and vision. So for Anishinaabek, uh, Zagdewin, which is love, is one of our primary laws of conduct. That's how we are to conduct ourselves, to recognize the love within ourselves and to recognize the love that is existing in all of the creation. So that means waters, uh, other relatives, including fish, birds, animals, um, and so on. And so address it. This is a quote from Dr. McGregor, addressing the historical traumas of waters by existing and proposed political, legal, and technical fixes is not likely to restore the balance that we're looking for. It's not likely to achieve justice or facilitate healing. So to me, my engagement is very much about trying to understand what are my responsibilities and how do I recognize that trauma is a common denominator of these times and moments. And that means epigenetic trauma, intergenerational trauma that's expressed through disease, addiction, pain, suffering, contamination, lack of wellness, um, uh, animals and waters that are sick and ill. And so these all are manifestations of trauma that live in the body and the spirit and the mind and in the emotions. So our task is to work with our relatives as Anishinaabeg and as all people to reimagine and reenact our lives as, as free from trauma, to accept our ancestral inheritance and heal ourselves. And so in doing that, I've learned so much from water. And there's a lot of people in my circle, my family, and my communities who have no interest in engaging academia. And I totally understand and respect that. But for some reason, it's always been something that I did. <laughs> and so I recognize that that's one of the things that like I do because I because I can or I desire to in some way, I suppose. Um, but ultimately, the teacher uh, and the master of life is is water. And so these concepts are uh, about addressing these these frames, right? The, the, the colonial frame that has arrived on our territory via uh, the wooden boat, right? And my grandmother, who was a uh, a speaker, a first language speaker of Anishinaabemowin. She knew a lot of the, the old language and she would talk um, about um, the different ways that, that we see the world, right? So when we see the world through the eyes of our ancestors, we remember that maybe our life wasn't perfect. Um, maybe our societies weren't perfect, but they were societies and we were human beings. And that was always our missive was to try to be good human beings. And that's what Mino Bimatsuwen is all about. So when we think about racism as like the sort of prima materia, the common nature of our, our current circumstances, we can see that racialization and abusive behavior is a facet of the structure. So um, it, that is a, a, an insult and injury to all of us. So for indigenous communities, um, like those that I belong to and am responsible to, um, treaty lands and non-treaty lands represent our homes of, of resting ancestors, our human and more than human relatives. The land is our ancestor and the site of an existing and pre-existing order. And so those are the um, some of the reasons why I do this work um, and recognizing that there needs to be a role for um, holding the grief of that awareness because of all the destruction that has happened. So when we think about dispossession, elimination, erasure, we see that genocide is a tool and the replacement um, of this new, or, new um, uh, structure is, has been the goal. But again, to circle back, um, the fact that Anishinaabek are still here and we still have our language and we still have our spirituality and thought, to me, that is, um, that is what keeps me going. Miigwech. Thank you so much, Lyra. Uh, so the way I'm going to be responding to this question, um, I'm going to leave my notes and I'm just going to tell you how I feel about this. Uh, so the reason why I do this work is because, first of all, I care. I care about what happens to my community and, and I don't know how I couldn't care, right? So 
Um, I also care because of what I know. And I care because of, of what I know, what I learned over time. There's just some things when you learn them, you just can't sit on it. So I do this work also because I have a story to tell, right? So I have a story to tell that I don't hear people tell uh, everywhere. And, and, and I think it's very important to, um, I, I think it's very important to speak at least for those who don't have a voice, right? And, and, and that's, that's extremely important. And the story that I like to tell is basically a story that says that the story of racism, the story of climate change, the story of capitalism is all the same story. And I know most people understand that, but the extent to which it is, is something that most people don't actually realize. Uh, so when we go back in that history, and this is why when I developed, when I started doing this work, I developed a passion for two things, culture and history. And I, I started realizing that a lot of the answers to the, the climate change issues that we have are actually cultural answers. So when I listen to uh, indigenous people talk, and I attended a lot of meetings, um, I think um, um, Catherine mentioned that I was part of the federal government national uh, table to create the first national uh, climate adaptation table. And at that table, a lot of the, the, the conversations we were having were about some of the things that indigenous people will be saying. And one of the conclusions in the report was that we need to move to a place where we all think about nature as something that we're part of, not nature as something that is different. It's, it's interesting because the government, although they put that in the report, they don't really have the capacity to make that change. So who has the capacity to be able to make the cultural change to make sure that we all start seeing nature not as just a source of resources, but as part of us and us being part of nature. Who is responsible for being able to do that? And this is so this is why I do this work, because in my opinion, um, we have to be the change that we want to see in the world. So each one of us, we have to do our part. We have to do something about this. Uh, so for me, that story, the story of racism, the story of capitalism, the story of climate change is all, all the same. And I'm not gonna be, I agree, we can't really go in details on, on, on that, but I'm gonna give you some pointers because I think people can even go and read about this and better understand. I'm gonna give you some pointers. One of the, in my opinion, one of the reasons why we have a hard time tackling racism in society is the fact that racism is actually part of the way we identify. So I call my organization Black and Voluntary Initiative. You probably identify yourself as a white person. All that, all this, all lies. This is not even true. Okay, so God didn't create white people. God didn't create black people. Okay, capitalism did. And so learning the story of, of how capitalism created us, <laughs> the way we identify ourselves, is extremely powerful because then you realize what you took for granted is actually not true. And the story that I like to tell is that we often say, oh, white people did this, white people did that. It's not white people. It's capitalism. It's capitalists who actually manipulated white communities, exploited black communities, exploited indigenous communities to keep doing what they're doing now, which is making profit over people. And it started a long time ago. I'm gonna give a second pointer. So I, I told you, we, uh, you know, you identify as a white person is a lie. Actually, we only started identify as white people in the 17th century. So before that, most of the world did not identify as a white person or as a black person. So this, this story is something that people need to learn. The other pointer is how, the entire story and even the destiny of indigenous people and African people and white people happen at the same time because of one historical event at some point and no one talks about it. And it, it all started in the 14th century when one guy decided to leave his empire in Mali, his name is Mensa Musa, to, do, to go to the Mecca. And on his way to the Mecca, he donated so much gold that 
the, the economy in Egypt even collapsed. So you can look it up, look up Mansa Musa. The reason why I talk about Mansa Musa is that this was the first time that Europeans actually realized that there was some natural resources like gold in Africa. So when they heard that, they started a process, and I'm, and I'm just simplifying the story. They started a process that allowed them to do the world explorations that led them to America. Okay, so we, it's very important that we understand the connection here is that if they didn't get the gold in Africa, they would not arrive in America. They would not do what they did to indigenous people there. But what the, 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 the importance of understanding that is that at the root of the, the story is capitalism. And at the end of it as well, natural resources, looking for natural resources. This is, that's all that it is. But if you watch society right now, they're trying to convince you that there's some kind of civilization fight between groups, uh, between race, between, that's not what's happening. What's happening is that capitalism is trying to keep going, creating profit, using nature, and they want to make sure that we people don't come together to stop it. So what they do is they make sure that you think you're white, I think I'm black, and we think we don't have the same interests, so we can't come together to fight that. And I think it's very important that people understand the, 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 what's really happening. That is the same story. It's, it's a story of climate change as well. And my last point that I'm going to make is that another reason why I do this work and I'm adapting this message to you, uh, your spiritual audience. I also do this work because it's part of my personal growth. And it's, it's actually, a, I see this fight as not just a political fight, not just a economic fight, but also a spiritual fight. And the reason why I'm saying this is that the, the story that I, I tried to tell very quickly just says basically that we were lied to we were lied to. This is a huge, you know that term, the big lie? There's a, there's a huge lie that is at, at the foundation of our society that is making all, all of us living, living in, in an illusion of what really is the reality. We're all human beings. The rest is just creations. And because, because we believe in that lie, in my, in my opinion, racism always leads you on the path of destruction. So when you believe these lies, it always leads you on the path of destruction. If it's not self-destruction, it's gonna be the destruction of someone else because you see them as less valuable than you are. And this is, this is the energy that is behind racism. So for me, even from a spiritual standpoint, the reason why I do this work is because I think it's the right thing to do. I think, it's the, I think there's a spiritual fight happening that is not just about my generation. And, and this is why even when I speak to young people, I tell them, um, stop worrying about the fact that the world's gonna explode. All you have to do is your part, you do your part, and then someone else is gonna do their part in their generations, right? So it is a spiritual fight. We all need to conquer the way that racism impacted our minds uh, so that we can we we can make sure that we treat each other uh, with dignity the way that God wanted us to be treated. Right? So I'm just going to end. Bam! <laughs> that was great. That was great, Nolo. Um, Why do I do this work? Well, I think you know, starting with what I said at the end of my introductory story, I feel we all have an obligation. We have an obligation to one another and all that is living and this planet that we're on. Um, I'm here, you know, in my, I was invited in my role with CAPE, but I can't disentangle who I am with CAPE. And so how did I get to CAPE? Um, I, I've been working at occupational and environmental health advocacy and social just advocacy for a few decades. And as I described, you know, I, I, I was born and grew up in Windsor, Ontario. And so the knowledge of, of the exposures that people face that led to ill health and oppression really shaped 
the, the work that I wanted to do and how I understood the world that I live in. And I, you know, I, I can't ignore what I see and what I know. And um, when, when I, a lot of the, uh, the focus of my work had to do with cancer and cancer prevention from the point of view of exposures from our environments that people can't control and this illusion that we're given about health and about cancer in particular and breast cancer is that if we just live a healthy lifestyle and eat the right things and buy the right products, you know, we'll, we'll be okay. And as I, I was doing my, my PhD dissertation on um, studying women with breast cancer. One of the things that became so clear is that there were all of these intersectional dimensions of this. And there's a lot of research out there about how um, black women are suffering from rates of breast cancer higher than other groups of women and um, where and why the exposures to breast carcinogens are higher. So Fast forward, I come to CAPE, which is a physician-led organization, which really embraces this understanding of planetary health. And part of that is understanding social determinants of health, which again is this understanding that as individuals, we don't necessarily have control over these influences in our health. And so part of that is recognizing that it's not just it's not just where you you know where you live what you eat it's the social factors it's the political factors it's the economic factors and so cape leverages its kind of social capital and relative power within this society that physicians have to try to influence decision makers to create policies and change legislation so that we have a more equitable and just, uh, you know, society for people to live in, and that we don't continue to have these disproportionate illnesses and impacts on Black and racialized and Indigenous people in these lands. So, CAPE has leaned in uh, and working in solidarity with Naolo and Ingrid Waldron, both co-founders of the Canadian Coalition for Environmental and Climate Justice, and and with other groups and members of our you know, the board of directors who are, you know, indigenous physicians working in their communities. And so I come to this work with CAPE, working in solidarity and allyship, knowing that if we continue with the status quo, and if we aren't requiring governments to act on the knowledge that we have, we're continuing to perpetuate this historical and ongoing legacy of colonialism and oppression. So, you know, really foundational to this for Kate is health can either, you know, be, a, 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 it can illustrate these inequities, or it can, it can be a way that we all experience the world in a more equitable and just way. Um, I'll leave it there because I do see that we are quickly running out of time. Thank you so much, panelists. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, the proposed legislation that's in the Senate right now, Bill C-226. Uh, where do you see potential whether it's it's opportunities or challenges, where do you see potential for this uh, for this bill and for this legislation? And uh, is it okay if I hop in on this one really quick? Just if I can pick up on on kind of what I was saying. I, I mean, of course, we there are always limitations to the things that you know we're advocating for, but I really do think this is an historic moment, and I do think that. It's, it, it speaks to that agency that Loyora was talking about earlier, Neola was talking about, and really the, this is, is the work of so many powerful, strong advocates, including Ingrid Waldron, and even you know Elizabeth May bringing this bill forward, the pr prior bill introduced by Lenore Zane died on the order paper. The, the, the sustained advocacy uh, and solidarity and allyship work of so many good people and, and communities and organizations have brought this to the forefront. And, you know, I talked about the physicians in our network and, you know, they, they see the impacts of, um, you know, exposures with specific 
eye problems in Indigenous communities in Manitoba, the inability for people to get health care in northern communities where climate change is, is melting the ice. Um, the, the you know the stories of the impacts on health of environmental racism are, are often invisibilized and so what this bill is going to require government to do is to formally document this and implement solutions and so i think that the strength of it will you know it remains to be seen in many respects but i think that's where we all have to lean in even harder now as government staffs up and creates the office of environmental justice that will be responsibleized to conduct the study and implement the measures so i do think it's an important and historic moment and i do think that it it is a step forward Um, I just would jump in very quickly and sort of echo that. Um, I think I'd really be curious to hear what um, you have to say. Um, so my screen is doing a thing. Sorry, uh, Naolo, I'd be really curious to see what you have to say. Um, and my comments are very brief. I, I think like many elements of legislation, risks and benefits, right? Um, but at the same time, um, knowing that the exposure to, to contaminants is something that is very well established for Indigenous peoples and communities and for other um, so-called demographics as well. And I, I really appreciate the way you phrased the, the great lie, Neil. Um, and at the same time, I think that those um, uh, impacts, uh, those physical health impacts are very real. And so many people in communities have been denied care, um, sort of gaslighted, told that the symptoms are all in their head, there's no correlation, that kind of thing. So I do see a great potential um, with this legislation to uh, validate the experience of some people in the ways perhaps that elements of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission did. Again, um, a lot of procedural methodological questions, but at the same time, uh, a lot of potential for greater visibility, which is always a good thing. Thank you so much. I, I think I want to start by saying this bill is really the, the result of the work of uh, someone like Dr. Miguel Walton, Lenore Zan. They have been at the beginning of that bill. And, and me, I was only uh, really, by start working with Dr. Miguel Walton, we ended up being part of that campaign. So I'm, I wasn't at the origin of this. So I just want to recognize that. I, it's definitely a step in the right direction. It's a historical moment in our, in our lives. And if the, the bill becomes law, it's going to be really, really a milestone, in my opinion. When we talk about environmental justice, it's always good to actually look at America. The reason why is because they had a, a, an older um, uh, environmental justice movement in America. And they've done a lot of that, where the government actually implemented policies. And, and, and that really helped a lot. Uh, so what the bill really will do is collect data as well. And that data will allow us to tell the stories. No matter what we're saying, there's still people out there, even if you look in, in Quebec, for instance, in Quebec, we don't even recognize the existence of systemic racism. So uh, try to talk about environmental racism. So there's many places in our country uh, and many people we talk to that uh, who just don't believe in the reality of the problem. So we need data to be able to show the reality of the problem. But it goes beyond just the, the narrative. It's also about protecting the people. It's, it's finding data to better understand uh, what are actually the, the, the hot spots of, of pollution in the country and, and what people are exposed to. Uh, so this is really an important bill. Now, there are some challenges. Uh, there are some challenges with what we can actually uh, accomplish with any bills. Uh, existing laws that are not even uh, uh, applied when it comes to uh, what what polluting industry is doing. We have we currently have laws that are not actually really applied. So 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 it's a big concern of mine that once we pass this law, it's not actually implemented in a, in, a, in a significant way. So we don't want just a symbolic victory. I'm against the symbolic victories. Uh, I don't want to be celebrating, and even one, once it passes, we might say, okay, yeah, great. But I want to see the impact on communities. I want to see the result from the law. 
and 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 I've been quite critical of the process of how uh, some and I'm not going to name name people, but some people did some kind of political <laughs> moves there to 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 look good on on the project. But it's part of life, you know. It's part of the the way things things happen. But this is why I start by saying we need to recognize Lenore Zan, Doctor Bill Waldron were actually the ones who did all this work. The bill, bill 226 is, is the same as bill C231, uh, I, I believe. And it's exactly the same bill. So um, it's very important that we, we, uh, we recognize uh, the people who actually brought, brought that forward. Thank you so much, everyone, for all of your comments. Um, Good to be aware of the opportunities and the challenges and where this bill fits in the larger conversation. Um, most of the, well, I should say all of the people who've logged in to attend today's webinar have done so because they want to learn more about environmental racism and injustice and they want to do something about it. So what can the people who are attending do to promote environmental justice? And um, Naolo, do you want to start? Okay, I can start. start. Um, well, I think I, I had I had a couple of notes on on, on that, but um, very quickly, what I tried to say in, in all my interventions was that at the root of the problem is a certain type of culture, capitalist culture. So that's what I said, right? So I think. Each one of us, the first thing that we can do is make sure that we don't actually replicate the culture that created the problems. So if you actually work on um, catching and managing racism in your own mind, that's the first step. That's the first step. Not just racism, also the capitalist tendencies. I'm reading right now a book about capitalism. The reason why I'm reading this is because I want to better understand the monster that we have to find a way to destroy. And, and not a lot of people are doing that because we assume that we know what it is. I promise you we don't know what it is. We live in it, but we don't know what capitalism really is. And when you learn about in detail from people who are experts, you realize how, uh, you know, from the beginning to now, uh, it, you know, capitalism is really a big problem, but we have to think about a different model uh, that's going to work. So in my opinion, the first step is how do you contribute to the culture at your own level, learning, identifying racism in your, in your own mind, and then uh, is there anything you can do to shift the narrative? Because we have to be able to shift the narrative. I, I'm always, I don't know if I find the words, but I'm always trying to, sh to show the people that when we talk about uh, pipelines, when we talk about uh, oil production, all of this is not just about money, it's about a culture. There's the culture behind it. And that culture, we are part of it. So the, the only way that we can change that culture is by changing ourselves. So I think the first step is what, what kind of personal change you can do at your own level. That's really what I think it is. The second uh, thing that we can do, and, and, I, I, and, I, and I like to share that in my anti-racism trainings, we live in a society where uh, we, so we reward behavior that we want to see, and we punish behavior that we don't want to see. If you look at society right now, every day, the media is pushing stories to remind you that you're white, that I'm black, and that these black people are against you. And the media is trying to always remind you that. And you will see, if you watch what's happening in the world, when someone does something that is racist, there's going to be institutions backing them up, rewarding them for what they did. And then when someone challenges the, 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 this, this system, they tend to be punished, right? So you want to be paying attention to what you reward yourself and what you punish in society 
because this we have two sides to that society the same way that we have two sides to our minds and we need to be able to reward the good side if i can if i can speak this way right so i think i don't know if i'm clear when, when i'm when i'm when i'm when i'm speaking this way but it's it's uh it's very important to see who you reward so who do you vote for right things like that right so do you vote for someone who who, who sometimes makes racist comments but you know uh is 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 very uh, charismatic do you vote for someone who's taking um who's who's taking risk in terms of climate action the reason why i say this is this is not just in my head bernard zan where is she she wasn't re-elected she wasn't re-elected despite being the one person who took the risk of pushing such important legislation and now when we talk to her we don't talk to her as an elected official she's just an individual and then once this law will be passed i'm not even sure that her name is going to be somewhere so um you know i don't know maybe there's some other stories but why she wasn't re-elected so we have to we have to pay attention to what we reward and what we punish in society i think it's very important uh and then maybe the last thing i would say if you really want to go in a more i would say um a heavy solution um are you are you a homeowner if you're a homeowner uh why don't you move to renewable energy right because uh anything that has to do with pollution hurts our communities anything even when you buy products and, and no one talks about it people don't talk about it even when you buy products that end up in the landfill it hurts our communities because the landfills our communities are the ones that are closest to landfills and the methane coming from that all that it's 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 impacting our communities and the last thing i want to say is when we talk about environmental racism uh one of the misconceptions is that we're talking about indigenous communities and black communities only but it's not the case whenever you talk about issues experienced by black communities these issues are also experienced by the entire community it's just that in the black and indigenous communities, we feel it more. We feel it more. So climate change is gonna impact all of us, but it's gonna be drastically more impactful in black and indigenous communities. So what happens in our communities is actually a preview of what's gonna to happen to everyone else. Indigenous communities have been dealing with the end of the world for a very long time. So if we want to know what to do about that, maybe we need to speak to them and ask them how they've been coping with it, right? So there's a lot of there's a lot of a lot of that. So I think there's there's a little, a little bit of humility that we need to build and and realize that we have a lot to learn uh, from the very people that we're trying to help. I'll go super brief on this, and I'm going to use the words of uh, a Cape board member who I mentioned before, Dr. Ogisto Horn, who is a Mohawk physician. Um, and we put out a message to our community recently um, with seven practices to in help eliminate environmental racism. And these seven practices were listen, learn, collaborate, act, advocate, share and give. And so you can do all those things in different ways, but I'll leave it at that and pass it over to Leora. Thank you so much, um, both of you. I think there's um, just a few things that I would say, and it's about thinking again through this intergenerational lens and inherit the idea of inheritance, right? And if we look around and see that the earth and the human ecology as well are in need of healing and repair and care. Um, those can be some of our most profound teachers, but also for that teaching and learning to not happen in isolation. Um, so for example, if people are um, connecting, you know, more um, intently, say with water, learning from water and, and think about what that means to be removed from water that you love and that loves you reciprocally, right? Um, and that's just a small fraction of what um, what people, Indigenous people and other people who are dispossessed from their territories might be experiencing, right? 
and the injustice of that and how like what does it look like to radically change our perception of of being human together uh, because I think that that is a lot of the work that we need to do um, as individuals, as communities, as collectives. And once we have a handle on that, I think um, a lot of the seemingly insurmountable challenges of ongoing processes like climate change become a lot more manageable because we start to see that we have a lot at stake and we have a lot that we can contribute to one another through a shared love of all that sustains us. Thank you so much, everyone, for your comments and thoughts here this evening. Um, we're getting to the end of our time together. Uh, so I'd like to uh, give our panelists the opportunity uh, to, uh, to share a final comment or thought um, coming out of our time together. And, and specifically, perhaps, if you could uh, share uh, one thought about what gives you hope. Uh, so what gives you hope? And, uh, and if there's any final thoughts you'd like to leave uh, our participants with. Um, I'll just go. I guess um, for me, my hope comes from the continual wonder of being on land and in water um, and learning so much about regeneration um, and through a non-human lens from relating to plants and relating to um, the seasons and even the daily cycle of a sunrise sunset um, because uh, we as human beings, we create a lot of problems for ourselves and our Anishinaabeg stories tell us about that. We have a lot of stories about how much we've learned from our follies. <laughs> um, and so keeping that theme going, um, understanding that as human beings, we are um, the newest members of creation and we have so much to learn. Um, that is actually what keeps me very hopeful about a different way of doing things. I'll go now if I could and Leah I know you asked for um if I had a link to those practices I can't reply in the chat <laughs> it's disabled um but an oft used phrase about hope is that hope is action and oh sorry my dog um, <laughs> um and uh, just as Naolo talked about how the media will try to portray I'm going to pass it on to Neolo. <laughs> oh, it's okay. We can we can hear you. No problem. Okay. Yeah, All right. Um, I think oftentimes we have this perception that it's that things are all bad and it's all problems before us and it's insurmountable. But I know that in my daily work and and my connection with community and when we look historically. There is action all around us, and we have made tremendous gains, even in recent decades, as we've seen the ascendancy of neoliberal capitalism and, you know, populist right wing movements in spite of that and against all of that people are acting and we are seeing change. And so that gives me hope that the, the spirit and collaboration of so many people who continue to work for something better. So it's action, it's in action. And if you, you take a look around, you will see all that action around you. And tonight is, is that, is it, it's hope in action. Thank you so much, Jane. Um, so I think maybe three things give me hope. The first thing is what I would call pockets of resistance that I see forming around society. And Look, I'm not a very, uh, when I say resistance, you're never gonna see me in the street really protesting and things like that, but there's other way to re resist. Uh, and, and, and for instance, recently, the two Justins in America really inspired me. I don't know if you followed what, what happened there and it, their fight was against gun violence. But again, I wanna repeat, this is the same fight. When we talk about gun violence, when we talk about climate change, when we talk about, uh, racism, all of this is the same thing. The, the, the people who are fighting for this interest are the same. So it's like, if you don't believe me, just look. The people who defend gun violence, the people who are against climate change, the people who are uh, against immigration, uh, you know, 
uh, who promote racism, it's all the same because it's capitalism. So for me, when I see people standing up the way these two guys stood up, taking the risk to do it, and, and, and doing it with a culture of self-love and self-empowerment and the culture that comes with it, the same thing, the kind of things we used to see in the 70s. So for me, that gives me hope. It really gives me hope. Second thing that gives me hope is the fact that I really believe we have to be the change that we, we wanna see in the world. So what gives me hope is the fact that um, I know I can do my part. So that gives me hope. And this is why when we speak with young people, I think we need to emphasize that. You know, we can't just look outside and, and, and say, uh, these other people are not doing right. They're guilty. Uh, this industry, they're the bad people. That's not what matters. What matters is that you do your part. And so I have hope because I know I'm doing my part and I'm gonna keep doing my part. So I have hope for that. And the last reason why I have hope is, uh, what gives me hope is my ancestors. My ancestors give me hope because when I look at what they went through and when I look at how they, they fought, they give me hope because they, they, they give us the models of how we're supposed to be resisting and how we're supposed to be fighting and how we're supposed to be surviving. It's not a one generation fight, it's a multi-generational fight. We all, we all do our part. So for me, I'm, I'm like, I have no pessimism at all. I'm very hopeful, not because I think I'm going to change the world, because I know I'm going to do my part. That's it. And, and I'm going to inspire other people to do their part as well. Thank you so much, uh, Liara and, and Niolo and Jane, uh, for, your, for your thoughts and sharing your experiences and expertise here this evening. Um, just uh, in closing, I want to say that uh, that this recording will go out to our uh, to will go out to people who are signed up for the for the webinar. Um, for anybody who is interested in learning more about Bill C226, uh, Kairos has an action open right now. Kairos is uh, is an ecumenical uh, justice organization and one of the members of For the Love of Creation, our host or the host coalition for this evening, and uh, and. And, and links to that uh, to that action around 226 will be included in the closing uh, in the in the uh, recording a uh, note that goes out uh, you'll get a link with a recording you'll get information uh, from uh, from our speakers uh, any any links that they that they've referenced that they'd like to send to you will, can there'll be an opportunity to include those uh, and and the action from Kairos around 226 um, I think that's all that I'd like to say other than um, my, my deep gratitude uh, for, for our speakers, for sharing their experiences and their knowledge. Uh, Leah, is there anything you want to, uh, to add? It's been an honor, it was such a pleasure uh, having conversations leading up to this event. So grateful for the, the wisdom and the knowledge that was shared by our wonderful speakers and uh, grateful as well to everyone who took time out of their evening to join us for this important conversation. So good night and, uh, and uh, we look forward to uh, collaborating again in the future. Good night Thank everyone. Thank you so much. Good night. Take good care.